Hello everyone, my name's Jim Catford and I'm going to be MC today. I see a f guy I know there, Scott, how are you? Um, if you can get your cuppers or whatever you're doing over there and take a seat, we'll get started so everybody can get away on time. I think everybody knows Lisa Gray. Lisa's uh, started the Good Blokes Guide and um, she's going to tell her own story, so I'm going to hand her over to you. Hello everyone. So again, welcome everyone for coming along this morning. Uh, this is actually our very first event as the Good Blokes Guide. Firstly, what I would like to do is acknowledge the sacred lands um, for which we are, this occasion takes place on. This is the home of the Bunwarung clan and I wish to expect my, express my requests, my, so I've got to learn not to talk fast. <laughs> um, express my re respect and gratitude to all the Aboriginal people past and present and future. It's my hope that we develop a stronger, more coherent understanding of the importance and the relevance of Indigenous culture, historically and in a contemporary sense. So uh, regardless, of, regardless of heritage, um, so that all people can experience equality, respect and compassion. Quite passionate about Indigenous uh, issues actually as well. So who am I? I'm the founder of the Good Blokes Guide. Uh, you may think to yourself, what is a woman doing starting a campaign around blokes? Well, because I saw a niche, I saw a gap in our community conversations, in our media betrayal, in our structural and political systems, which acknowledge and celebrate all things men and boys are doing well, and that uh, demonstrate value, love, compassion, and the richness in all of our lives. What I did see was an insightful and intelligent woman called Rosie Batty, who polarised the country through her bravery and through her messaging about the need to stop domestic violence and need to stop bad blokes. From destroying the lives of women, children and the lives of men also who have daughters and sisters and girlfriends. What I also see and I hear a lot about are the statistics of men and boys committing suicide that are so desperate and so destroyed and so alone that they feel that their only resolve is to, do, is to take this path. My question to you is, I guess, what's gone so wrong in our society today where this seems like the only option for a lot of young people and older gentlemen, and particularly the highest stats over 75 years of age for men committing suicide, for those who don't know. Um, I also now, thankfully, hear a lot about post-intervention programs and services targeting male mental health. There are some powerful stakeholders and individuals who are championing and validating, validating the rights of men to seek support. I too lost a brother to suicide, um, and I also have a teenage son who is, has certainly had his struggles and uh, has certainly keeps me on my toes. Um, so I guess like many of you in the room today have probably got a personal story that relates to this issue. I've spent many years working in the fields of child protection, domestic violence, family support and working with high-risk adolescents. Um, I've also written many policies and strategies which focus on the behaviour of bad men, bad blokes. But today my guests here, these lovely gentlemen, and I want to talk to you about the good blokes, young and old. I believe in a primary prevention approach. I also believe in, the strength, in a strength-based and solution-focused philosophy for life. So by extension, the Good Blokes Guide is focused on the positive well-being of males. It's about educating, encouraging all males of all ages to have a positive sense of self-worth, healthy social connections, and a self-assurance to seek advice when they need it. I believe through education and validation, we can support young boys to grow into confident, resilient, aspirational young men, and for men to be open and capable of tackling any emotional challenge that comes their way in a calm, resourceful, and supportive manner. The Good Blokes Guide is about prevention, education, and connection. I feel very privileged to have our guests here today, um, who've all volunteered their time, so thank you very much. Um, and I also feel very privileged to have you here in the audience today, because obviously this is an issue close to your heart. I will now pass you over to Jim Catford, who's kindly agreed to step in at uh, the last minute, because our MC actually decided to head off to China <laughs> at short notice. So Jim's a, a lovely gentleman as part of Peninsula Voice. If people have heard of Peninsula Voice, they certainly put on a lot of um, community events and most recently held one youth mental health and had over, I think, 450 people, thereabouts, in a... Well, that's fine, we'll just work the stats. Um, and I'll pass you over to Jim, and Jim will introduce our guests. And basically today is very much about an organic conversation. If you've got a question, 
the gentlemen are speaking and you've got a question, please just feel free to put your hand up and, and ask. Because this is actually being podcasted as well, so um, if you've got an issue with that, please let me know. But uh, the, your questions will be repeated so I don't have to run around the room trying to um, get everyone's questions answered. So I think that's where we're at. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, yeah let's give her a clap. Well, as Lisa said, I'm the ring-in, the last-minute ring-in. I'll introduce myself uh, very briefly. I started life out as a farmer in South Australia, go the crows, um, and uh, then went into pastoral ministry, uh, studied in America for six years, came back, uh, was principal of a theological college for over a decade, uh, then went back into pastoral ministry, and I still do that. I also, just so I get into the real world uh, from sort of the church life. I also have done business coaching, small business coaching over the years as well. Um, I've had two marriages. So I've got uh, two kids from my first marriage, uh, a son who's in the film industry in, uh, in Denmark and a daughter who's in small business in Sydney, married with two kids. So I've got two grandchildren and I've got three step children from my second marriage and uh, they're all grown up and uh, left the nest except for one who's nursing and still at home. So that's my story but it, I guess for me the interest I have in this whole area is it took me till midlife before I started feeling anything. Um, I was talking to some a younger guy, Michael, earlier um, before the breakfast and just the um, you know, I can remember my first wife asking me, you know, what are you thinking? Well, nothing. Uh, what are you feeling? Nothing. Um, and you try and rake something up as a, as a male at times, and uh, it just wasn't there because, uh, well, sort of dead inside. I don't know whether anyone else has had that experience. And it was kind of the crises of a midlife experience that actually awakened uh, a connection between head and heart. Anyway, it's not about me, it's about these alpha males on the couch here this morning. We, we want it to, to be really relaxed and casual and, and so forth, so I'm going to introduce each one. Uh, they're going to share a little bit about their background and why um, this whole subject of positive male well-being is important to them. Um, and then, of course, their individual expertise will come out. If you have a question, um, you can interrupt, um, but don't interrupt too often or we might be here all day. Um, but if you do ask a question, ask it and, and the, the speaker, direct it to a speaker. And for the podcast, they will uh, ask the question again so we can all hear rather than passing the microphone around. So the first gentleman on my right is David Mallard. He's a uh, unique senior management consultant advisor, trainer, and senior coach. Uh, when I was reading his bio, I actually had to look at what the C-suite meant, and many of you will know that, but um, he's in the rarefied air of uh, uh, consulting with chief executives and heads of organizations. Um, but he's also got a great interest in men's well-being and helping men uh, to really connect with one another. And so he's president of the Melbourne's men group, of which he'll say, more about in a moment um, and he's been doing that for 20 years so a great wealth of experience there. Let's welcome David. Um, I'll hand this over in a moment. Um, next to David is Blair. Blair is uh, has uh, 20 years marketing experience and uh, he's the head of partnerships at uh, AFL and uh, again, at the high echelons, I'll let him give you the detail of that, but uh, let's uh, welcome Blair. Um, Chris Menage is uh, a versatile educator, and I think he's been in more countries than I've had roast dinners. He's um, at Peninsula Grammar, uh, head of International Boys Boarding House, and uh, has uh, a boy and a girl, a uh, father of a boy and a girl, and of course has a great interest in, is it uh, tribal, cam uh, tribal camps and that sort of uh, area? And Yeah, you'll, you'll tell us more about that. Uh, but his work with uh, young people, of course, young boys, and uh, particularly international students. Um, 
and Dean is the acting inspector at uh, Vic Pohl. He's in plain clothes today. Um, he's White Ribbon Ambassador, as you, you will see there, and uh, father of a couple of boys. Um, Dean has uh, had a history of being involved in uh, the local community and local government and so forth. So uh, welcome each of you. Let's uh, give them a clap. So let's kick it off. I'll hand the microphone over and it can just go down the line. Um, tell us a little bit more of you, about yourself and then why uh, male mental health and so forth is important to you. Thanks. G'day, folks. Um, yeah, Dave Mallard's my name. And um, I won't go into my history and details and too much about that. Um, uh, so as, as the introduction outlined, so I'm president of something called Melbourne Men's Group. And um, we've been running Melbourne Men's Group, we meet in various areas around Melbourne uh, each month. Um, and we've been doing that for 20 years. And the whole focus of um, men spending time with men is to create what we call authentic relationships. Um, not necessarily based on what car you drive, what job you do, or what footy team you follow. Um, uh, which give, raises the question, if, if men can't talk about that, what else can they talk about? Um, uh, but it's is based on, the, in, on the, um, the sense that how do we create authentic connections between men because one of the challenges we find in, in our Western society and, and in, in Australia in particular is that men get socialised from childhood within the context of an emotional straitjacket. Big boys don't cry, harden up, toughen up, don't share how you really feel. And that sets men up for failure in terms of relationships. And um, one of the things I've certainly learned through the running of, of our men's programs, our, our regular meetings, and our we have development, um, accelerated development programs over the course of a weekend, and we have some really deep dive workshops. Um, look, you know, looking at not what so much is happening in this place up in the head, more about getting access to what's happening in the heart and pulling open the armour that men tend to wear around their hearts. And how do you best integrate that? So it's about developing emotional intelligence, in a sense. And, um, you know, being able to create those authentic connections between men. Um, so um, we do, we spend a lot of time doing that. And we find that, um, what we, certainly what we know is that at the core level, uh, we're all basically the same. Um, we're all basically the same. And um, the, the big challenge for men is, uh, how do you deal with isolation? Because men from our society are isolated from each other. Because we don't really share about what's really happening for us. Because it's not, you know, inverted commas, manly to do that. So we're about changing that paradigm and, um, and creating those conversations and connections and, and experiences where men can actually do that without judgment and, you know, how do, how do you be authentic with another, with another bloke? I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thanks. Thanks, David. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and as uh, Jim said in the introduction, my name is Blair Crouch. Uh, I moved down here to the peninsula with my family uh, about seven years ago um, and now feel very much part of the community down here. And um, just to acknowledge Lisa and the work that she's done in creating the platform for the conversation today, but ongoing around the simple question, what's a good bloke? Um, what makes a good bloke? Uh, what do you have to do to be a good bloke? I think is a really important conversation um, for us to be involved in. So my reason for being here, I suppose, are, um, are a couple of, of main ones. Um, firstly, when I think about my career, uh, I realise that most of my career has been, been spent around um, people who can have an influence either positively or negatively on what it is that we were trying to do. And most of those people have been blokes. I started my career at, at Holden and did, and did a lot of work with the Holden racing team. You know, we had young men representing our brand and pe young people like Craig Lowndes and Mark Scaife and Greg Murphy. Interestingly, we had a young ambassador, a guy who was an outstanding swimmer, um, a guy called Grant Hackett. Um, and as we've seen later in life, Grant's obviously really struggled with some of the things that, um, you know, we've witnessed um, recently with him. The second reason I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be involved in this is um, I now work in an organisation that is um, obviously dominated by young men and thankfully you know, we've seen the success of the Women's League 
in the last few weeks. So I feel like we're having some positive influence about changing the focus just on men. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into the conversation about that um, during the breakfast. But the third and most important reason that I want to be involved in this is that I'm the father of two young boys. Uh, I have a seven-year-old son and a four-year-old son. And I'm probably now at that age and um, realising that the influence that I can have over them um, as a father, as a leader, um, is a very important thing and the most important thing that I can do in, in my life. So I'm um, certainly very interested to, to learn from people like everybody here that has an interest in being here, um, but importantly, understanding how I can be the best father that I can. So that's, I suppose, my summary and my background. And um, thanks all for being here. And hopefully it's a good conversation. Thanks, Blair. Morning, everyone. Uh, so Chris Menage, and I suppose there's three themes as to why I'm here this morning, and many thanks to Lisa for the initiative and for the effort in organising it. Uh, personally, I have a, a little boy and also come from a family of four boys, and I had a father who I probably didn't really know until the age of 14 when he, went, um, he made some significant life changes which included we moved country and we moved back to where we came from, which was Mauritius at the time. Um, and that's when I found that he really worked a lot on his, his uh, personal skills and, and who he was as, as a man. Um, and I suppose that's where my memories with, with dad began. I also lost a older brother at the, when I was about 27, he was 32. Um, and I suppose that was a bit of a crossroad for me where I started to sort of think, what was the purpose of why we're all here and, and what we're meant to be um, trying to achieve. And, um, and then I, I have a beautiful uh, little boy and I, I work with, I've been working with boys um, for the last 12 years um, in a boarding context. Um, so nine years with Western Australian uh, country kids who are very uh, exuberant and, um, and passionate. And then more recently, for the last three years, with international kids who have offered, afforded me a very different perspective on, on what it means to be a, a young boy. Um, so I'm really excited by what Lisa's trying to do in this sort of conversation. Looking forward to learning from all of you as well. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. So, um, Dean Clinton, um, I've been in the police force for around 17 years. Um, I won't go into the boring stuff that I do now, but um, probably about 10 years ago, for a number of years, uh, worked as a youth resource officer. Um, during that time, um, I was actually pretty young and probably, you know, cool at the time. And um, I found, you know, it was reasonably easy for me driving a fast car, having a few tattoos to sort of connect with the kids. Um, and, you know, whether the kids were young in primary school or whether we were going away on camps um, and they were teenage kids, um, you know, I got to see probably uh, the good and the bad. Um, our job's a little bit different, so the number of reasons I've got for being here and finding, um, you know, positive uh, male well-being important is because, you know, we deal with probably the, mostly with the kids that have probably gone off track. So um, it was good to get exposed to some of the good kids as well as, you know, some of the kids who needed help in that role. Um, from 2014 to 2016, uh, I work at Dandenong now, but I was working out of Frankston, um, both covering Frankston and Mornington Peninsula local government areas um, as the proactive unit manager. So I sat in charge of our youth resource officers there um, and also our response to a number of portfolios, youth, family violence, uh, mental health, alcohol and drugs, and, um, and a number of others. But uh, Again, you know, there's a lot of things that we dealt with in that space um, and, and, you know, a lot of, I mean, the family violence stuff as a White Ribbon Ambassador as well, you know, predominantly, yes, it is, uh, you know, male violence against women um, and just seeing the effects that that violence in the home has on young boys in particular, um, both that childhood trauma side and also the fact that they then, you know, can progress to being offenders themselves. So. I guess um, why male wellbeing is important to me, apart from some of those um, reasons, I also have two boys um, and I want them to grow up the right way. Um, you know, I already see the way, and they're only six and three, but I already see the way that they interact and the way that they act and then the way that some of the other kids act, you know, that are at their childcare. Um, one of them's now started school. And, and it's interesting to see, you know, some of the traits in some of these kids at such a young early age. You know, I'm not suggesting there's anything going on at home, but you know, there's, there's already some bullying behaviours and things that I'm certainly trying to make sure that my kids don't exhibit. 
Um, the other thing which has already been touched on today is, is suicide. Um, you know, too many men are committing suicide. It's, you know, four times almost that of women. Um, missing kids, uh, over 50% locally are young boys. Um, I think it's about a third more than, than we have girls go missing. Um, and most of them are between the ages of 10 and 19. I think in the last 12 months, uh, there was over a thousand young boys go missing in Frankston, the Mornington Peninsula, um, 1,055 if my memory serves me correctly. Um, some of the other things are, you know, cyber safety, bullying, aggression, you know, one punch assaults, sexism, uh, use of pornography and sexual assaults, you know, drug use, mental health. Um, I just made a bit of a list, but, you know, the list probably goes on really. Um, males are overrepresented in our crime stats and in the prison system. Um, and I suppose that's in a nutshell why, you know, I see this as being so important, what Lisa's doing, trying to drive that change from, the, um, from this end. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Terrific. We're going to sort of move around with a few questions at different places, so I'll just hand the mic as we go. So one for you, Chris. Um, I spent four years in a boarding house in, uh, in Adelaide, so I hope it has. <laughs> I'm the twisted man I am today because, no. <laughs> um, how would you describe the challenges of young boys that you come across? Thanks, Jim. Uh, look, I think I could probably relate it back to one thing, um, a lot of what I'm going to say, and it comes down to time and how we use that time. In my, and I do have to have a caveat here that I'm not an expert, and this is just based on my, my experiences, so they're observations. I believe that very strongly that um, children are a mirror of, of what we prioritise and what we um, establish for them. and so. With the busyness of modern life and the priorities that we are setting ourselves, I believe that our children and our boys in particular are being shortchanged somewhat. Boys respond to shared experiences. They respond to time together. Um, they are very um, uh, tactile. We're, we're a very tactile um, being, and things sort of grow organically. Um, it, it's not as it's not the same as with um, girls, perhaps where it might be more of a, uh, a verbal connection. It needs to be some, sometimes uh, evolved or, or organically. So because of the fact that family units are, are breaking down, because of the fact that we have a lot of um, two you know, dual, dual income families, parents are busy, um, we tend to compensate for that with material possessions. We tend to compensate that with um, outsourcing and as a, as a result, I believe that bo boys find themselves somewhat rudderless um, and searching for those role models that in the past they may have had. One of my um, favourite memories as a child was, or not a child, as a 16 year old, was spending hours with a great uncle who was 82 at the time. And we used to go fishing together. And we used to go for hours fishing together. And often it would be in total silence. Um, but when he did talk, I would learn about his life and his, um, his experiences. And that would help me to process some of the things that um, you know, I was going through at the time. And I didn't realise it at the time, it was only afterwards. Um, but I sort of think, and I wonder whether my son would, will have that time if I'm too busy. I've just come back from a conference in um, Sydney, for instance, on positive psychology. And I find myself arriving at home at midnight on Saturday night. Um, Sunday, I quickly took him down to the sailing club and you know, we did some sailing together. Um, but then Sunday, I was working again afternoon and I was preparing for this. And I was, at one point, he was saying, you know, do you want to play with me outside? And I almost heard myself say, no, mate, I'm too busy. And then um, I really had to catch myself. So I would bring it back to time, how we use that time. Um, but there's obviously extenuating factors like, I think technology is a real issue that we need to look at. Um, and unfortunately, with our society, we often need to go through experience before being able to have enough data to look back on the impact. But the way that boys use technology and what they are doing with that technology, Grand Theft Auto, for goodness sake, they get prizes for hitting people, uh, doing things like that. If you're doing that from the age of six, seven, eight, and you're doing it for 10 years, is it any wonder that when you're 18, you, you, that sort of behavior is normalized? Um, pornography, is, uh, Dean just alluded to it, is, is also an issue. It normalizes that type of relationship. Um, and if they don't have a reference point to refer back to, um, that can be a concern. Um, look, yeah, we could talk for half an hour just on that one question, but I think that 
that sums it up. Thanks. If I could, Jim, just one thing that Chris mentioned there, which I think is something that I've only learnt recently, is the importance of male influence outside of the father. And one thing that you know Chris touched on there was the fishing experiences with his uncle. Yes, it was a family member, but you know I think one thing that you know I've consciously tried to do older in, as I get older is to actually spend time with with other men that that aren't my father and i think often the influence that they have on me as a person the way i view the world typically it relates back to a business challenge for me so i have business mentors but ultimately that's one thing that i've taken out of learnings recently that i'll be looking for chances for my two boys to spend time with other men for a different perspective on life that doesn't just you know reinforce perhaps my view um, i think that's an important point that you just sort of touched on there thanks blair well really that you've preempted the next question, which is um, to you, David, uh, what are the elements that uh, are needed to produce a you know, well-rounded young man? And uh, we've already really got some of those elements there, but. Um, thank you. Um, well-rounded young men, um, the point you raised around spending time with other men is super, super, super critical. Boys need time with their fathers and they need a lot of love, but they need time with their fathers. And, and another man in particular. Um, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, and, and um, if you read any of Bidoff's work, he's done a lot of work in this space with men and you know, how to raise boys and, and, and girls as well. And one of the key aspects is just spend time with the kids. So it is really important. And you know, the, one of the questions for me is, in, a, in, the, in the context of our culture, who are the, the mature masculine role models that boys can aspire to, apart from you know, sportsmen and, you know, Great sportsmen tend to get raised within our culture to be at a you know some sort of other level, um, but apart from that, where do they get their role models from? And is it through Grand Theft Auto? Or is it through movies or TV? And there's you know that balanced, mature, masculine role model. They're kind of hard to find when you think of it within the context of our culture. So where do boys go to learn how to be a man? And um, that's a real challenge. And, and I see it through our men's group. We've got hundreds of members, and I see new members come to every meeting. There's new guys rolling up looking for something. And this is guys from you know, 25 to 45 to 50. Some of them are going through that midlife transition and they're starting to ask questions. And the, the main question is, well, who am I? And I think everyone asks that question at some point in their life. And a lot of people don't know what the answer is. Um, and what I know is through the experience over doing this for 20 years, is that um, a lot of men really don't know who they are, um, but they're actually still that little boy, you know, looking for something, looking for answers. Maybe it's looking for love sometimes. Um, and not just looking for love from other people, um, but one of the clear messages is through, through our work is that they're actually looking for that love inside themselves. You know, getting to the point of self-esteem where they actually are really happy in their own skin. Um, and, you know, just spending time with other men, whether you are 45 or 5, is actually a very important thing where you can work with and, and spend time with people, not, not judging others, not comparing how big the size of your paycheck is, just spending time with, you know, who you are. And, you know, I said, mentioned something earlier, uh, vulnerability is a real challenge for men. You know, being safe to be vulnerable. And the paradox is, and I know this through the work we do, it's actually, that's where the strength comes from. The strength is in vulnerability, but particularly with other men. And um, I find that's one of the things we really work a lot on is getting out of this place up here, where we tend to spend a lot of our time um, and getting more into this place and how to best integrate the two. Because that's, that's the key, getting the integration. But spending time, spending time with other men, whether you're a young kid or an older guy is really important. I'm going to have to lie on the couch in a minute. You can counsel me. Um, Dean, um, you've raised some of these issues, but the major issues involving young people for the police, what, what are they? Um, I just quickly wanted to touch on the previous question, actually, but um, something that I think is important and something that I've probably only learnt in the last couple of years 
as I've gone up the ranks in the police force, you know, you get a lot of training around strategy, um, planning, um, you know, having a vision. And, you know, something that I think, you know, probably when you're um, not in that management position, you don't always know that when you're working for an organisation, you know, what, um, what is it that you're actually trying to achieve, you know, as a group or as an individual? And how are you actually doing that? So having that intentional presence within the workplace, um, I'm getting somewhere with this, <laughs> um, you know, and, and actually, you know, that intentional presence is about, well, what am I trying to achieve and how am I actually getting a step further each day? How am I making sure that happens? And just touching on what Chris was saying, you can do that in your, in your home as well, you know, as a parent. You know, I think choosing to actually spend time with your kids and choosing to ensure that your kids have those opportunities to interact with other men, that's an intentional presence and making sure that, you know, you actually, I don't know how many parents actually think, where do I want my kids to end up? And, you know, how can I actually make sure that that happens? So um, just adding on to what you were talking about. But um, as far as the major issues police see involving young teenage boys, my, my view is probably a bit jaded <laughs> because again, we see, you know, the, we see a lot of the, the bad kids really, but um, probably the most, you know, that, that social media thing is a real issue, you know, that networking, loosely based networks, cyber safety, that sort of stuff's a real issue. Um, it just allows people to, to network more freely, um, you know, probably, a real small percentage, but a small percentage of young people are now committing more offences than they used to. Um, you know, and that's really impacting on us and they can mobilise very quickly with social media. Um, you know, one of the other issues is, uh, I suppose, you know, if you've looked at the media recently, you know, the more serious type of offending as well that's been committed. Um, and <clears throat> I guess though, just to humanise, you know, these kids in a way, um, I'll give you like a, a rough story of what happens, you know, regularly or quite regularly is, you know, one of the kids, for instance, that, you know, um, we've dealt with a number of times, you know, he's sort of the leader of a pack and, you know, he, he's a lot of bravado and he's, he's, you know, he's acting tough and, you know, he's committing a few crimes and, you know, he'll, he'll fight the police when they go past and he'll yell and scream and, you know, and then once he gets back to the police station, you know, and he's put in an interview room um, because, you know, we might not have a choice in, in what we, how we have to manage this kid, you know, he's crying and, you know, just like any other kid would and, you know, wants his mum and dad, you know, and, and the thing is these kids' mum and dads aren't always there either. So, you know, a lot of times they won't answer the phone. If they do, they won't turn up anyway. So, you know, that's just an idea of where these kids are coming from. Um, and another one, again, is, you know, I won't go d deeply into the story, but, you know, a kid a number of years ago when I was working, um, you know, taking some drugs, so he'd misuse drugs. Um, you know, he was chasing after his family he was trying to, he didn't know where he was, he thought everyone was aliens, he grabbed a steel star picket trying to kill people basically and when we turned up we took the attention off the family so that they were safe. Uh, you know, we went out into, a, into the street where there was no cars around at the time um, and, and we distracted him and managed to, you know, de-escalate the situation and, and restrain him. Um, that kid had to be sedated, went off to hospital but, you know, the next day he came in with his family um, and once the drugs had worn off he was actually extremely apologetic you know this kid didn't have a, a horrible history um, and um, you know we we ended up sort of having building a bit of a relationship and you know he sort of me and a couple of other police were like unofficial mentors to him and he, he came out on the other side fine you know so they're not always bad kids but the causes really and that's what we try to deal with it's that risk-taking behavior you know that young men display I don't know if that's as common with young girls um, peer pressure, you know, when kids are in groups, you know, that's when we see a lot of trouble and escalation of what they're doing. Um, a lack of respect and a lack of guardianship, you know, I mean, there's plenty of research on this, but kids that, you know, don't have a home to go to, you know, that whole idle hands the devil's playground, well, you know, kids that aren't being told to come home and that are just hanging out late at night with other kids, you know, that's a recipe for disaster, I think. Um, early victimisation and neglect, um, you know, that leads to mental health issues, disabilities, um, there's plenty of research on that. Low family incomes, because kids can't always access what other kids can access. Um, poor housing, you know, we've got eight kids living in a, a three bedroom houses. You know, some of these kids are 16, 17 years old with babies in the house, you know, they're sleeping on mattresses on the floor, so they don't want to be at home. 
Um, lack of commitment at school, truancy, you know, that's always an indicator there's other issues and risks going on in the home or maybe outside the home, outside influences. Availability of drugs and lack of neighbourhood attachments. So I'll get to what we can do as a community later. But, um, you know, if kids aren't engaged in the community and the community aren't engaging the kids, so it's a bit of a joint um, situation, then, you know, then you, you can have some, some issues. I was touching on something that um, Dean just raised about um, kids, boys being uh, risk seeking. And I think there's a really interesting tension here in our society between that reality, which we, I think we all accept, and how we're evolving in the sense of um, we're increasingly a risk averse society. And Australia is soon to overtake, I believe, uh, America as the most litigious society per capita. And we have a schooling system which is increasingly um, dictated um, by policies that are about m mitigating risk, and, and that's all well and good. However, if we think of the importance of being able to make mistakes for boys, in particular in, during those formative years, then um, if we extrapolate that a little bit, we're denying them the opportunity to, to sit back and, and to reflect on the mistakes that they've made. There's a beautiful book by a gentleman named Richard Louvre called Last Child in the Woods, and in there he talks about the importance of boys being able to, or kids being able to, have that interaction at a younger age where they get into a punch-up, for instance, and they see the impact that they have on their peers at a younger age, so that in seeing that consequence at that age, they understand that if they were 18 and they were in the pub for the first time and they were under the influence of alcohol, they would think twice before going for that one punch, which could have far more dire consequences with the police or getting behind the wheel of a car you know, under the influence of alcohol and driving and, and not understanding the consequences of that. So I think that's an interesting uh, tension that exists between the need for risk but us perhaps not providing the opportunities for risk. I'm going to stay with you. Um, just on that, and then, then we're going to go to, to Blair, to, and the question we're going to ask Blair is, uh, what's the culture like for young men in the AFL? It is a, a different culture, I, I'm assuming, uh, with all that talent pool. Um, but do you think we miss something, um, and you all might want to have a go at this, um, in Western culture by not having the sorts of rites of passage that uh, Indigenous cultures have? Do you want to speak to that and maybe pass it around? Uh, yeah, Jim. Uh, look, it touches on one of my concluding comments, is, which was uh, around what education systems are doing to address this. And I think we are starting to do a lot more around rites of passage. I think rites of passage are really important. I think what's more interesting is looking at why we are having to formulate formal programs around this. And it comes back to that initial point of time. It's, we need to formulate these, these formal policies and uh, programs because the community the village that, uh, that uh, David referred to is no longer there. You, you know, a lot of the community clubs that used to be um, very busy 20, 30, 40 years ago, we may have progressed in society in terms of our standard of living and our affluence. However, in, in other um, key indicators, we've actually regressed. And I think Western society is at a little bit of a tipping point in that, in that we're, we're considering what are we doing to our children? Um, and is, is this where we want to go? And, Thankfully, we in Australia, with the standard living that we have, we've got the luxury of being able to s to sit back and reflect on that um, a bit more profoundly. So, the, the research around rites of passage are very, is very clear um, for young blokes. Um, and I, I took my boys on rites of passage programs with the Pathways Foundation, who do some fantastic work in this space, and others play in this space as well. And in fact, all Indigenous cultures, all their boys go through rites of passage, going through, you know, childhood to manhood in inverted commas and they you know as part of that process they have to face a challenge by themselves something scary for them and um the research from that the pathways foundation has done and they run rites of passage for boys and girls they're different but um what they found is that the guys who have come through and the you know 13 to 15 roundabouts but the guys who have come through that process and have gone through that rites of passage and it's all joseph campbell stuff face your fear come out and you work out you know more about who you are um uh, what they found as those guys have progressed through to adulthood, they tend to be better balanced, um, have more successful lives, are happier within themselves as compared to kids who haven't gone through that process. And part of the rites of passage process is, you know, finding more about, finding more about who you are, but also having respect for the people around you, women, um, and respect for yourself. 
Um, so that whole, the rites of passage is very important and Western culture doesn't have it. It's been lost. And as we become more individual within our culture, the need is actually growing and you'll see it through, you know, risk taking behaviour. Too busy making money and, you know, focusing on the consumerism of our culture. You know, so um, I know through my own experience of my sons on that process that um, extremely valuable and really important for them. Yeah, there are, there, are, there are rites of passage programs, so the Pathways Foundation is an example and there are others who have formal rites of passage programs where you go away five or six days with your son, with other fathers, and um, yeah, there's a challenge involved. Yeah, there's a challenge involved and, um, you know, and it's part of the young fellas facing their fear. Yeah, so is it an event or is it a one-off? So with the Pathways Foundation, it's a five or six day you know, event or experience for fathers and their sons. And there's a very clear process of disconnecting from the mother. So that's part of the process where the fathers and sons honor the mother, leave her behind. The, they, the guys go out you know, for six days in the bush. Then there's an integration process where the men come back. It's not the father and the son, but it's the two men that come back and reintegrate into society and the boy is different. So it's psycho a psychological maturation process. But there's a very clear process of working through the stages of masculinity through to manhood, if you like. The most transformative uh, rites of passage program that I've been involved in is one that was run out of WA uh, with Scotch College where the boys linking to the indigenous culture, yeah. the boys walk um, the Bibulum track from Perth to Albany, so a thousand kilometres over five years, so 200 kilometres a year. And if you take Celia Lashley's analogy of um, parents get off the bridge of adolescence and let you let your child walk over that bridge on their own. Um, these boys went from year eights, um, learning to navigate, orienteer themselves, cook for themselves, um, and then walk through at the finishing line as a year 12 boy, as a man. Um, it was a very, very, very powerful thing. Um, and their parents were there at the finishing line to greet them, but they weren't allowed to obviously be there along the way. And they faced a lot of challenges along the way, you know, uh, physical challenges, snakes and so on, blisters, but then also mentally teamwork, learning about themselves and tapping into that. You need to love yourself first before you can engage positively with other people. Um, and I think they gave boys the opportunity to talk about those unmet needs that they had. The majority of men should undertake a rites of passage. And I, I would agree with that as a statement. And I, I did something five years ago called a vision quest, which is based on indigenous cultures again. And it's fundamentally that process of working through, working through facing your fear. And the vision quest is 10 days and there's a four day solo in, in the mid, midst there where you're out in the bush by yourself and you're fasting for four days. And you, you know, you're not, so you're not eating for four days. And you, you, fundamentally it's about facing your fear of and asking the question, who am I in the context of the universe? And it's, it's the same process, but it's working through that psychological. And for me, it was like going through that psychological boyhood to manhood stuff. Cause I had never done a rites of passage as a child. And what I recognized in completing that, that's really what it was for me working through boyhood to, to, to manhood, even though I was, you know, 50 years old when I did it. Yeah. Just about the question from before, Jim, about the AFL. Okay. So uh, interestingly hearing the conversations today, um, and I think it's been fascinating even for me to learn about things like rites of passage today, but it also sort of reiterates to me that fundamentally what I do is very much, you know, about a game. Um, you know, the AFL is a great organisation, but fundamentally, what we do is we, we support a sport, but sport is so important, I believe, in communities, in teaching, especially in um, you know, relevance to this morning's conversation, young men to understand what it takes to be a leader, what it takes to be a team player, uh, what it takes to you know, sacrifice and to look after your mates and to have a positive, uh, positive influence on others. And I think at the end of the day, if we at the AFL can be um, charged with creating a game that's important to communities around this country or around the world, then fundamentally we do play an important role. As an organisation, you know, we've changed a lot in the last number of years since the leadership of Gillan McLaughlin uh, took over from Andrew Dimitriou. Um, Andrew was a great leader, but he was a quite an old school leader. Gil is a 40 year old father of now four. Um, you know, he's very in touch with um, his own family. He's very in touch with his brothers 
Uh, he has three brothers, uh, a very close relationship with them all. You know, so I think he's had a very positive influence on the organisation. Um, we're very focused on our people. We're very focused on um, um, diversity. Uh, we're very focused on the social issues that we think we can have an influence on uh, throughout the communities uh, through sport. You know, my team, for example, I have a team of 12, um, eight of which are female, uh, two of who are um, part-time females returning from, from maternity leave. So we're a very contemporary, normal corporate uh, environment, I suppose, um, with our own challenges. Um, that's no different to any other corporate environment. But um, again, as a, as a sport, if we can be seen to be playing a role to positively influence the conversation, and perhaps this morning's conversation is one that we need to think about how we are more supportive of, um, then I think we'll be playing our role. For the sake of time, I'm going to stay with you. Um, how does being involved at that high level of sport, does it change males, and if so, how? Uh, look, I think we all know it can change males. Um, you know, there's been lots of stories of um, very public stories of, of young men who have struggled with, um, I suppose, the fame that comes with uh, being successful at the AFL. If we're speaking in in particular about that, um, but I think as a as a uh, a governing body, I think the AFL is very good at at uh, ensuring that the education programs that we run right from when kids come in, you know, talented footballers come in at the age of 12, 13, 14. There are a number of programs that, um, that exist right through to when they become drafted by a club um, that hopefully protects them from, um, you know, from the pitfalls of, of fame. Um, but in reality, um, do people change when they, when they reach success? Um, Often yes, um, but I guess it's the job of those around them, um, the football community, um, the organisation, to make sure that they're they're supported, um, and uh, and the pitfalls hopefully uh, are few and far between. For for, uh, for for young guys coming in, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, and I think one of the challenges that we see often is you know talented uh, boys and now girls um, coming in through our um, pathway programs. You know, not everybody uh, is going to make it, um, you know, to the high level. So one of the challenges off the back of that is perhaps loss of identity, you know, for some of those kids who have been the superstar at their club right throughout. And then they perhaps, for whatever reason, don't quite make it. So um, that's another challenge that we face too, is just how you help those kids, you know, how the Players Association help those people who, for whatever reason, don't end up playing 300 games or being, a, you know, an absolute champion. Um, because probably for those kids, that's all they've ever wanted to do. Um, so finding balance outside of that for their lives when they get to 22, 23 will be really important. I'm assuming that would be a fairly high percentage. You know, not everyone's a Simon Madden, are they? <laughs> um, so that would be quite huge, I would imagine. Yeah. So if you think at the moment there's about a million registered participants around uh, Australia. Um, there's 800 men playing um, listed football and there's now 200 girls playing listed football at a professional elite level so you know you sort of look at the just the numbers alone it says that there's a lot of people out there who have an interest in sport interest in the AFL but there's only very very few that make it make it to the top so you're right um, we need to work out how we support all those that, that don't. I'm going to Chris now and I'm going to ask two of your questions together again for time. Um, do young boys feel safe to be themselves around peers? And also, do you find that boys wear a mask hiding their true feelings? And if so, what does this mask look like? And how can you help boys remove the mask? So two things there. Thanks, Jim. Um, look, touching on what Dean was saying earlier um, with his uh, you know, relevant stories about um, boys in difficulty, I think um, boys are a mirror to um, what we provide for them. And so, so what I mean by that is that if, if they are not given the opportunity, the permission to fail, um, then they will have unmet needs. And those unmet needs will be expressed in, in different ways and sometimes, unfortunately, in ways which might mean that they make the wrong decisions and those decisions have got um, consequences. But being a teacher, I'm fairly idealistic that I don't believe in anything uh, such as um, there's no such thing as a bad kid. Uh, kids are inherently good and they are learning and they are trying to find, find their own way. So do they feel safe to be um, themselves? I, 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 believe that they, I believe that they do, but they are a little bit fearful of making mistakes because I don't know if we're providing the right context 
within which they can make those mistakes safely. Um, linking that to do they wear a mask? Look, I don't really think so. I think we're in a, we live in a really tolerant society today, and I think we've made a lot of progress about um, sexuality, um, interests. You know, I've worked in a boys' school. I've worked in a, in a co-ed school. In a boys' school, you know, the boys celebrated um, a young man dancing ballet on, on, on the stage. And when I was at school, that certainly would never have happened. Um, there would have been eggs thrown at that poor, that poor lad. So I, I do feel that they are able to be themselves and that they don't need to wear a mask. Um, having said that, I think that we probably may need more of the, the structures to allow them to discover who they are um, more, more formally. <clears throat> Dean, I'm going to put three. Your, all your three into one as well for the sake of time. And I'm sure there's some questions uh, from uh, our guests today. So if you've got questions, you'll have opportunity um, after David's had the last word. Um, so Dean, what are your suggestions for strengthening relationships between uh, police and young males and parents? And all the questions really are around parents engaging their kids, uh, how can they help, how can they uh, get support and all of that. So can you kind of summarise all that up into a bundle for us? <laughs> I can try. Um, again, I'm certainly probably not the expert in the parenting side about where people can get help, but I've got a few notes here. Um, my suggestions for strengthening the relationship between police and young males, um, that's really about, you know, positive engagement with the police, I suppose, like I was talking about with youth resource officers, you know, where um, it's about building trust, getting to know the police for those kids outside of, you know, us rocking up and asking for their names, really. Um, so you do need those opportunities to actually, you know, show them that you're actually human um, and that, you know, there's, there is positive interactions there. Um, you know, there's, there's actually a number of things going on within Victoria Police um, currently and, you know, in the past as well that we do to try and strengthen relationships, um, not only with just boys, but with diverse communities, girls, um, like the, what we called the pilot program in Dandenong. Um, we had the Maori Wardens in Frankston as well, where, you know, we, our police go out with um, community leaders and, um, you know, engage with communities where it's hard for us to actually engage at all, you know, even in a positive way, um, because they may have mistrust or there might have been a history there. Um, you know, so I think we're getting smarter about how we do that. Um, and they're, they're doing more of that. Um, once you build that trusting relationship, you know, then, you know, you can actually speak to these kids quite um, easily. Um, you know, and, and one of the other issues we have sometimes as well, though, is if we have the same police doing the same roles, you know, we get, oh, that's the good police, you know, and that's the bad police. So, you know, we, we also want to try and get all of our staff and, you know, embedded in those sorts of programs so that we can, um, you know, ensure that you know, as a collective, because we get seen the same, um, you know, we people actually trust the police and, you know, um, but that is a difficult one. We have school programs, you know, we've got programs at the moment in Frankston where some of the highest risk schools, uh, we have members going in and out uh, liaising with the kids that are at risk, uh, the kids that are getting dropped off at school at 7am and babysat by the playground, um, you know, kids that won't turn up to school um, and also just all the kids in general just to build those relationships. Uh, there's some mentoring programs, there's other programs in the pipelines that they're working on at the moment. Um, they just um, announced 42 new youth resource officers will be employed across the state as well, um, which is a positive thing, I think. Um, Social media, um, a few people have touched on earlier, that's a big gap, you know, I mean, these days, uh, I mean, not just kids, but just about anyone, you know, if you can get them to stop looking at their phone, and I'm probably guilty of that too sometimes, you know, then, you know, good luck to you, because that's where their head is 24-7, so... You know, policing's not really that exciting to these kids. You know, we don't have exciting apps and games. Um, so that's definitely a gap, I think, that, as you said earlier, needs to be exploited because social media is such an important thing these days and I don't know if we've got our head around that yet. Um, one of the things I was going to say about improving the relationship is, you know, I think it starts at the beginning. You know, I think good parenting, you know, is, is something that's important too. Um, 
raising boys, um, you know, behavioural expectations, I think, are sometimes lower. Um, I know boys and girls, are, you know, can be different, but, you know, I think really all kids should be raised, you know, with love and, and, and you know, being able to make mistakes. And, you know, I don't think we should have, um, you know, our oh, boys will be boys. And I think that's just the easy out. Same with um, something along the lines around, you know, I mean, I, I'm passionate about, you know, I hate it when somebody goes and commits a crime, might be sexual violence, family violence, and, oh, but he's a good bloke, you know, well, that's why I see what Lisa's doing is so important, and I know you didn't quite touch on it, Blair, but uh, the AFL, for instance, you know, it's important that they give um, kids out there an opportunity to see what a good bloke really is, and that's why it's so important that they get it right, you know, when you're in the public um, eye because what Lisa's doing gives people an opportunity, to, these kids an opportunity to see outside of the home environment, outside of just that one stream, what a good bloke actually is. Because I don't think a good bloke is someone who goes and commits sexual violence or family violence, for instance. So, um, you know, and even what I've learned, it's about empowering kids as well, and I'll go into this in a minute, but, you know, <clears throat> I empowered myself over the last few years by learning a lot more and reading a lot more and speaking to a lot of people, um, attending a lot of forums outside of work as well to try and learn more about, you know, the portfolios that I was in charge of. And, and I've learned a lot in the last probably five years around, you know, the causes, underlying causes of family violence, um, even youth suicide and, and some of these other risks. And when I first started raising my boys when they were born, you know, I, I just knew what I knew because that was the way my I was raised by my father and you know I thought that exactly what you were saying about saying you know oh, you know don't cry you know you need to toughen up you know you do what you think is right based on your own experiences and I think we need people to open their eyes and actually see that there's more than just your view of the world um, and uh, solutions for parents who are struggling um, I mean, my first note here is I wish I had the answer, um, and I, I don't have teenage boys yet, so ask me again in 10 years, but, um, so I don't know how I'll go, but, um, you know, good kids come from bad families, bad kids come from good families, I've seen it all really, so, you know, that whole nature-nurture, you know, if you get it right in the home and you, you give them the most supportive environment to live in as well, um, you hope they make the right friends. Um, Prevention is always better than cure, um, you know, but really professional advice, if you've got someone that's got significant issues, you know, a child that, that needs help, whether it be because they might be suicidal or whether it be because they're violent, your GP is actually a really good place to start. Um, but there's lots of websites as well, just make sure it's a reputable one. Beyond Blue's actually got heaps of parenting advice on there. Um, there's other websites as well that can help you out with advice. But if it's something criminal or, you know, family violence or something that, you, you know, there's a real risk to your kid or a real risk to, you know, you or someone else, then yes, the police and other um, emergency services, you know, can help you. Um, we have embedded, you know, social workers now in our family violence teams. We have um, an alcohol and drug clinician that work with police seven days a week in this area that, you know, for certain hours of the day goes to the jobs to help treat these people in the home. Uh, same with mental health issues, you know, we have a mental health clinician that works with police seven days a week um, who go out and can treat people in the home. This is to prevent people from getting arrested, you know, from getting dragged to the hospital. Um, it's about, you know, we, we are getting smarter about how we support people and, and it's that restorative, rehabilitative approach which is, is really important. Um, but just my, uh, like I said, I'm certainly not an expert and I don't know how I'll go yet, but empowering kids, one of the things my youth resource officers who do have older children um, do often say, and it's in the research as well, you know, empowering kids to actually make decisions themselves is really important, I think. Um, you know, if you've got an issue with your child and you don't want them going out because you feel like they're at risk, and this is the low, low end of the scale, but, you know, Tell them why you're worried about them, what the risks are that you identify with that particular situation and empower them to come up with some solutions. Say, no worries, fine, you can go because if they, you don't allow them to go, they might go anyway and then they're at greater risk. Tell them, you know, they can go, negotiate the time they can go till and how you're going to get them there and get them home. But you might want to talk to them about, well, these are the risks I see. What are you going to put in place? What's your safety plan to make sure this doesn't occur? And then I'll support you going. So it's about actually, you know, it's not quite the rites of passage, but it's just explaining to them, you know, that they can take responsibility for themselves and, and give them an opportunity to, to feed into that and give them some responsibility, help them grow a little bit. Um, 
but that's about it from me. At the risk of getting on a tangent, what's the apex gang and guys like that? Is that about identity or is it more complex when, when kids sort of gather together as a group like that? <sighs> That's probably a tough one to answer. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in that field, but um, <laughs> um, I don't know. One of these guys might be better at answering that question, actually, probably from a social sense. Definitely not an expert, but I would probably hazard a guess. It's maybe linked to what we're talking about, and I think where education systems are going, which is to try and help kids understand what they want to, who they want to be, as opposed to what they want to do. I think there's a real distinction there, and I think for probably the last couple of decades has been a, a focus perhaps too much on on uh, the latter, on, on on what you want to do, and that means that they've lost out on those opportunities to discover who they are um, and what types of behaviours do they want to display. Um, yeah, and I think education is now at an interesting crossroads and an exciting one where we're focusing increasingly on on that notion of um, what sounds like common sense perhaps to us, um, but you know, what sort of behaviours do you want to display? Is that, that social what, capital wanting to belong to something? A lot, a lot, so the question was, is that that social capital? Um, yeah, the, yeah, and social emotional learning, which we were talking about before, um, those sorts of programs, and you know, like the conference I've just come back, which is on positive education. It's um, there's a lot of really innovative work going on in that space. From an AFL point of view, I was just going to say belonging to a, a group, that loss of identity, that kind of need to be involved in a team, is that somehow, could you elaborate a little bit on that or as far as the last question was concerned? Just that need to be part of a group, I suppose. I certainly need to qualify this with, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, but I think the great thing about sport, um, and whether that be AFL or soccer or netball or table tennis or sailing, you know, it does create a sense of community, a sense of belonging, um, which I think is important, whether that can have any positive influence on some of the challenges that we're seeing faced by, you know, some youths in society at the moment, I don't know. But, um, you know, I think over, over history, it's been shown that, um, you know, sport is a great, um, a great thing as a social um, lubricator, I suppose. Um, and I think importantly, that does give kids something to aspire to. It teaches them good behaviours and good disciplines. So, so therefore, I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle. But whether it's the solution or not, I, I, I don't know. But I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. Thanks, Blair. And David, can you just sort of round us off? There seems to me two things going on for you at least, if not for all of us, uh, healing broken men and helping them in their midlife and uh, or whenever it happens. Um, it could be youth as well. Um, and then the preventative side, the, um, you know, helping people grow up and, and so forth. So That's a very interesting statement, uh, are men broken? And we hear that, a lot. I hear that a lot, you know. Um, and uh, uh, that the fundamental belief of the work that we do is men are not broken at all. There's nothing wrong with men. That doesn't mean they can't develop a lot, like, like men and women. Um, one of the challenges boys and men face within the context, the broad context of our culture is the emotional suppression cycle we all grow up within. You know, when a child is from zero to three, they're very emotional, they go off and they pop and, you know, and they do stuff and, and that, that's all okay because that's what we expect. When young blokes start attending school, you know, five or six to ten years old, uh, they get policed within the schoolyard. You know, don't show your emotions, don't cry, you know, big boys don't cry and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It still happens. So boys learn to shut down their emotions and they shove it down and that trans that go, goes through, you know, as, as, as boys grow to 15 to 20 to men, it's the same principle. And I see this through the men's work that we do. That men, most men, most men, it's a big generalisation, so the men that we see coming to a men's group, um, A, they're showing a lot of courage because they're taking a risk. Because they come to a place where you're in a room full of men and what, you're going to talk about how you feel? You know, most men would say, <laughs> no way. There's no way I'm going to talk about how I feel, because it's you know we're supposed to be strong and vulnerable, and we've got it you know we've got it all together. We've got all you know we don't share any of that stuff because that's what men don't do. This is within the context of the culture we live within, 
And we have six men in Australia who neck themselves every day. Six men die in this country every day by self-inflicted death. Six men. And how, 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 how many, how many um, people die in car crashes, single-car car crashes, are blokes? So, you know, there could be even more than six a day, I suspect. What I really believe is that one of the reasons that happens is because men are not encouraged to be in touch with them, their own stuff, their emotions, and who they are in the world. And that starts in, in childhood. Big boys don't cry, you know. What are you, a girl? Harden up. And that, that sets up men for failure in terms of relationships, particularly intimate relationships. Because in, in your intimate relationship with your partner, what happens is, as you probably know, it brings up all your unresolved issues and you project it onto the other person, particularly when you're having an argument, you know, or, just, or, or an active conversation. Um, so we find there's a lot of guys who come to a men's group, they're looking for something. And they're looking to address the issues that have, haven't, been, haven't been solved through their childhood and through their upbringing because of the emotional suppression cycle that we all live within as blokes. Harden up. Harden up, guys, you know. And it's not healthy. So, as I said, we see guys who come to the men's group and they're looking for something. And this is the minority of men, okay? Because most men don't go there. I'm not going to talk about how I feel. <laughs> what are you, you know? What do you think I am? Um, so, but we do see guys who come to the, and they're looking for something. And, and here's an example of what happens at a, at a men's circle. So we run men's circles and they, we create a very safe environment for men to be able to share authentically. So we had a circle, you know, 20, 25 blokes in a circle, and you have a talking stick. And whoever holds the talking stick holds the floor. And when you finish speaking, no one else will comment. Because what men tend to do is they're very outcome focused, which is great, and they'll like give you advice because they care. But it's about fixing. It's about fixing, because men like to fix stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that. Except that it tends to be attached to an unconscious judgment. This is what you should do. Because I know I'm better than you, or, you know, whatever. Um, which, which tends to reduce the, the extent to which men are willing to share about how they really feel. Okay, so we don't do that at the circle. We don't try and fix anyone because our belief is you're not broken. But um, so the talking stick went around the circle and there's a guy who didn't say anything and he had an opportunity at the end to pick up the stick. And this is, this, this, his comment goes to what this is about. He picked up the talking stick and he said, no, I've listened to everyone in the room, all the men in the room. And he, he said something like, the only thing I have to say is, now I don't feel so alone. This is the challenge for men, is isolation from other men. And this starts in childhood from boyhood, because we're not encouraged to be okay as men with each other. We don't talk about how we feel, we talk about our job, our car, or the size of our pay packet, and it's, it's all bravado. And if we talk about masks, of course they're masks. Everyone wears masks. If we can create an environment and a culture where men and boys are okay to be who they are and to be authentic and to create authentic relationships, we're going to create healthier men because what we know through our men's work, when we do the work on ourselves, um, you have the transformative changes within. It's, it's the old saying, for things to change in my life, first I must change. And that's the underlying story and the lesson from all the work that we do with men's work and I think is really important to recognise. For things to change first, I must change. Thanks, David. Here's some questions, Pierre. Um, you're directing your question to someone or just the panel generally? Yes, okay, question for the panel. Maybe I'll take the mic round now. Uh, yeah, I certainly can uh, understand where you're coming from uh, in regards to men being at, coming together as a group and, and opening up and talking about stuff that puts them in a very vulnerable place. And I work with perpetrators of family violence and a lot of men walk into the room with massive chip on the shoulder against the system, against everyone else who won't side with them. They come in with full of false pride and ego, entitlement that it's all about me. Uh, from that extreme down to the extreme of, I totally messed, messed up, you know, I am just totally broken, I am shattered. I, I need someone to guide me, to help me uh, move 
forward in life. And the, and the great thing about uh, about the group is that they do come together just like your groups do, and they feel like they can talk about whatever it is in order to understand where they went wrong. And so it brings me back to the question that I had, and that for me, um, what to, you know, how do we make boys into good blokes? For me is we change ourselves. We can't change the world, but we can change ourselves. And, that, and, and if the boys see that change, then they want to aspire to that change. But just quickly, um, one or two sentences, what was your conclusion of that, that question? How do we change a, bloke, a boy into a good bloke? As I said, I'm certainly not there yet with my own kids, but um, yeah, look, I think it's just about supporting them and, and empowering them, you know. Um, and I was doing a bit of research last night as well, and also decided to take my sons for a bike ride while doing in the middle of the research. But um, you know, I think it's about prioritising, and you know, I think it does take a village, as I said. You know, it's certainly a community; um, it needs the whole community. But I think, um, as a parent, um, as a father. Um, you know, I just think you need to commit that time and, and make sure that you make it a, a safe place um, and allow them to, to grow and empower them, make them be responsible for some of the things that, uh, some of the outcomes and some of the things that they do in their life. That's my thoughts anyway. What a fantastic question. Um, I would bring it down to one thing and it's probably best summed up by a brilliant educational uh, educator called Sir Ken Robinson who talks about helping kids and in this case boys find their passion. I'm fortunate enough to work in a brilliant school which gives kids so many avenues to uncover what their passion is, whether it's music, whether it's debating, whether it's sport, whether it's going to do community service overseas, whatever it might be. And they celebrate that and that child is able to be truly celebrated for, for what they bring to the party. And um, there's an ex-student who's here today, and I think of the class that we had last year and the, the, the level of uh, um, uh, the quality of the conversation that we had as a class um, was because they all accepted each other and they all accept, uh, celebrated each other for, for who they were. And I think that's a, that's a very powerful thing to, to help kids find their passion. I think based on that, <clears throat> I think I need to enrol my boys in the Peninsula School. Um, um, probably for me, pro oh, sorry, it's changed, <laughs> beg your pardon, sorry. Um, probably just to build on Dean's point, for me as a father, I think uh, it's not just about time, but it's about being present when you're actually there. I think we're all guilty of being there, but not really there. And I think technology is a real problem in, in, in that regard. And I put my hand up and say, I'm, I'm, uh, I've failed uh, in relation to that in the past. You're sort of in the room, but you're really checking email and doing a, a million other things. So um, for me, it's quality time, but, but also being present when you're there committing that time. Absolutely, I agree with everything you've said. Um, time is very important. And we tend to make ourselves time poor because we're so busy doing all this other stuff online and whatnot. We live in an online age and the, and the, the paradox is people have never felt so alone which is interesting in our society according to the research. Um, uh, I would agree with that, spend time with boys, particularly fathers. Um, uh, give them as much love as you possibly can. But one other thing is also work on yourself in healing your own wounds from your childhood. And one of the things I did, I found as I um, had my kids were young, um, I was doing things with them that my dad did with me that I didn't like when I was a kid. And I thought, hang on, what is going on here? <laughs> and I was just starting down that personal development track and um, understanding more about who I was, you know. And the thing that I learned is, um, uh, you know, don't repeat those patterns that didn't work for you and think about doing it a different way. But just spend time with them and tell them that you love them. Tell them that you love them and tell them again. Okay, that's one of the, the bottom lines for me. David, Blair, Chris and Dean, you're good blokes. <laughs> Thanks for your time today and your wisdom. Um, I have great hope for the future if you know there's more like you uh, emerging in our culture that are willing to stand up and share their, their hearts, their lives so vulnerably and their expertise. So let's give them a round of applause and thank you.
and uh, you connect good blokes with good women and we've got a, a really powerful uh, element. Lisa, thank you for the Good Blokes Guide and for your initiative there and we'll continue to cheer you on and support you in that, but uh, we'll let you have the last word. I think it's, um, it's ironic that I'm here <laughs> and you're all there and um, as I've always expressed the fact that I'm just, I'm just the person behind that tries to, you know, the architect is the way I describe it, um, because I saw a gap and, it, and the conversations weren't being had. And quite frankly, I could sit here for another couple of days and, and listen to this. Um, I find it quite overwhelming. And um, this is for me, if I can bribe you all to come back every month, <laughs> I think I'd, I'd love to, you know, to have these conversations on a regular basis, because I think that it's really important that this is the first of many, um, and, and we do this differently, and it's almost like from, from my perspective, we almost need a, a boys circle, you know? So we need that early conversation, and, and not necessarily for people that can afford, you know, Peninsula Grammar is expensive to get to, but from a community perspective, if we can have those groups that are accessible from an income, from a, you know, transport, from a family perspective, then I think, you know, that's, that's a pretty amazing place to be. I have um, some very humble small gifts. Um, I'll fess up and say they're Lint's chocolates, so you can um, <laughs> share them with your families. And um, I'm hoping that, um, that a few of you might be able to stay. I know, Blair, you've got to head off a bit early. Um, but there, I think there are some people that are in the room that have still got questions. Um, and so I'm hoping to feed you. <laughs> um, but if you've got some questions, um, if you can hang around for a little bit. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll do something similar maybe next month and kind of keep the conversation going. Um, but as I said, ultimately, this is about positive psychology. It's about positive reinforcement. It's about getting to kids at, a, at an early age, but it's also about encouraging those blokes that, you know, that are working with David and working with others to kind of go, you know what, I'm okay. And uh, I can talk to whoever I want to, and I don't, I won't feel, you know, I won't feel all of those stereotypes. Um, we've got other people like um, Gus Warlord from the Man Up series that's supporting this initiative. Um, there's a whole bunch of, I've got meetings with some of the other AFL people um, this week, as well as um, Master Builders Association. There's a whole bunch of people that are really keen to, to sort of look at this because it hasn't really been opened up. I don't think it's really been discussed. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you everyone for coming along too. And if you'd like to stick around and have a conversation and um, if you'd like to keep, we've got a website, so it's called thegoodblokesguide.com.au. There's a Facebook page. Um, so just keep engaged and keep the conversation going. And thanks for coming.